What I want to do now is give you a broad survey of some of the modernist elements in an Andalusian dog, and then we'll move our way into a more detailed look at the specifics of the film. Firstly, we have the element of shock, such as the initial image at the start of the film, which you probably can't get out of your mind if you've just watched it for the first time. Uh, incredibly influential image as well, I'm going to come back to that later on, but worth doing a Google search just to see how often that image has been appropriated uh, by many other people for many other purposes. Self-consciousness. The film exhibits an apparent awareness of its own status as a textual representation, and this self-consciousness is contributed to by numerous other modernist elements. Fragmentation. The film is made up of a collection or montage of images at different times and in different places. Incoherence, I already mentioned. Dehumanisation. This is both caused by the self and wider social forces. There's a tension there between internal and external influences on one's identity. Ambiguity and multiplicity, which I'll come back to. Intersubjectivity. You may have been looking at the interplay between the writer and the reader's subjectivities in written texts, and this can also be applied to the relationship between the filmmaker and the viewer's subjectivities. Symbolism, where you've got an endless array to analyse with this film. An engagement with Freudian ideas, various parts of the films can be related to the idea of the subconscious, to dreams, to sexuality. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on Freudian readings of the film because this has really been a, a massive area of the literature around Osho Andalou. Uh, useful texts include Edwards and Kovacs in uh, the list at the end of this video. So what we want to think about is what thematic and stylistic aspects of the film develop these modernist concerns. When you look at the themes of violence, fetishistic sexuality and death, you can see this revolutionary film exploring themes through an innovative use of new techniques. We've got to remember that the medium of film is relatively new at this point as well. In terms of subject matter, physical violence is linked directly to sexual excitement. Think of that scene where the woman is about to be hit by the car and the man's uh, behaviour in the lead up to that and in the aftermath. It's almost like he's approaching orgasm. And this scene and others like it really embody the Surrealist movement's twin obsessions with sex and death. What Surrealist artists actually did in Paris was get together at someone's home and they self-research sexual fantasies by interrogating them each other with per quite personal questionnaires. In combination with these thematic concerns, it can also be enlightening to think of the techniques and conventions, and particularly how those techniques and conventions are used unconventionally in the film. Think of the plot. The links between events are often unclear, if not non-existent. And the characters. Characters are unnamed, the relationships are unclear. The setting is an illogical or even non-logical non connection of places. A door opens up and it can lead to somewhere completely different. Settings are not just geographical, they're also temporal, and time is crucial to reflect on. The subversion of linear time is thematised throughout the film. Think of the early scene where the bike's wheel is being foregrounded and it seems to be moving back and forth. You've also got the man's earlier self being apparently shot by his later self. And there's also a very explicit reference to time when, towards the end of the film, uh, the new lover holds up his arm with a wristwatch and the woman forces it down very, very clearly. The relevance of the intertitles is also very unclear. You probably don't see intertitles all that much these days unless you go back to your childhood favourites and watch the now awful Three Amigos film. This use of intertitles had previously been used to clarify aspects of a film's plot and setting, but here it actually makes things even more murky. In relation to music, what you hear is a combination of Beethoven, Wagner and an extract of a tango. What's really important to note is that Bunuel added this in 1960. Early performances of the film were actually accompanied by a record. So keep that in mind. But does the music that you hear accord with what is being shown, or is it contradictory in some way? Another key issue is imagery, which encourages connections between seemingly unrelated objects, such as the woman's underarm hair becoming a man's moustache. Is this just, as Michael Gould claims, a quote, riotously funny depiction of the battle of the sexes? Or is it a reference to fetishistic sexuality, as I mentioned before? The use of dissolves was quite new at that time as well, and these worked to construct associative images in this way. Montage is absolutely fundamental to surrealist film. Bunuel referred to this as, quote, the golden key of the film, which combines, comments, and unifies, end quote, all of its elements. You might also like to think about the use of surrealist humour. Even if you weren't laughing on the outside, and I'm sure a lot of you were during some parts of this film, you know when things are supposed to be comic. 
and the use of the grotesque or comic grotesque is very powerful in some parts of this film. It subverts what may be considered good taste and perhaps even highlights that the idea of taste is a very subjective phenomenon anyway. Then you've got closure. Does this film have any narrative resolution? I dare say that I don't really need to say much more about that. You couldn't have been all that satisfied with the conclusion. Now I'd like to talk for a few minutes on the paradox of making it new. You've no doubt been talking about this in relation to other texts. The concept of making it new is paradoxical because there's always a reliance on pre-existing forms and conventions. And Un Chant en Delou, as innovative and as new as it is, is certainly no exception in this regard. Bunuel was influenced to some degree by earlier experimental films such as Germain Duluc's The Seashell and the Clergyman from 1928. This film had some point of view shots from traffic in the streets of Paris. You might also like to think about uh, more biblical narratives. What roles do corruption or the fall play and redemption in this film? How does that get thematized in the different uh, fragmented stories that we see? You've also got quite an innovative merging of different genres throughout the film such as the fairy tale, you've got the Once Upon a Time uh, title there, uh, horror, you've got severed limbs, an ant-infested hand, uh, these are there supernatural elements in this. There are also, when the man wakes up on the bed, I often sort of think it's a he is Johnny or a Count Dracula movement. There seems to be vampiric connotations and the woman holds up what appears to be a crucifix at one point. Uh, romance, the scene at the end, you have sort of the, the young couple running along the beach, um, the Western, a very old genre as well, uh, it's among the first film genres and if you remember that part where the man's got two guns, you can interpret that as many Freudian analysts have as an erect and flaccid penis. So it links in with the sexuality uh, theme throughout the film. You've also got a mystery and detective story, when the man's been shot and he appears somewhere else, you've got a group of people that seem to be uh, collecting around the body, uh, working out what's going on. You've also got comedy and you don't need to go past the scene with the priest tied up to the piano being dragged along uh, with the dead donkeys there as well. And just as an aside, films like Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz seem to be doing something still pretty new and innovative with their blurring of generic boundaries. So that shows just how ahead of its time, if you like, Ursha Andalou really is. Now, the big question. Does the film mean anything? What's interesting in relation to this is that both Dali and Bunuel actively encourage the idea that their film was meaningless. Schneed quotes Bunuel as saying, Dali and I used every gag that occurred to us, and we relentlessly threw out everything that might have meaning. So where does this leave us? Are we just going to go insane with this film? Let's have a think about the opening shock. A collision exacted on the eye. How do we interpret the slitting of the eye in the opening sequence? Is it the director's mission statement or a warning? Is it saying what follows will shock you? Is the film informing the audience that they will be shocked by shocking them? Is it implying that nothing is sacred? This could be connected with Bunuel's critical attitude towards religion. Is it suggesting that viewers need to look beyond the surface of this film? But they will not see anything. You can look, but there's nothing to see. The film, like modernism, does violence to representation. Surrealist scholar Stephen Barber notes that the film, quote, carried the potential to impact upon its audience far more directly, immediately, as an assault on representation, as well as upon the human figure, than any other media in which the surrealist movement worked. Does this sequence link to themes developed in later images, such as the violence towards women, or male desire, the idea of being blinded by desire? Is the slitting of the eye a self-conscious reflection of technique, the editing or cutting process, which was relatively new again because we're looking at film? You could also look at the account by Liebman of the various linguistic puns relating to this scene. He links the image to sexual penetration, among other things. What's really important here is that writer-slash-director Bunuel himself plays the man with the razor. Might a barber represent an artist? Bunuel claimed in an interview in 1960 that he had dreamt of the slitting of an eyeball, although he had earlier credited Dali with the idea. Dali, incidentally, plays one of the priests in the short scene where they're tied up on the floor. The surrealist theorist, poet, playwright and filmmaker Antony Artaud had expressed a great desire for a surrealist film to be, quote, a collision exacted on the eye. 
Subsequently, Michael Gould has described surrealist cinema as open-eyed screening. So you've got a play on words here which shows how the film and the surrealist movement are informing each other. Now let's think about ambiguity, multiplicity and the impossibility of meaning making. Are the images in the film completely random as the filmmaker suggested? Or are they meaningful? And what about the imagery in the final scene of the film? There is no right or wrong answer here. I read this scene in relation to the film's historical context, the destructive effects of war. That's what I see in the mise-en-scene that's created with the apparently dead male and female form sticking out of the earth. Bunuel wrote in the film's original shooting script that, quote, everything has changed. We now see a limitless desert. The man and the young woman are in the center of the screen, buried up to their chests in sand, blinded in rags, being eaten alive by the sun and by swarms of insects. Or does this scene, and perhaps the film more broadly, represent the death of experimental cinema itself? Surrealist filmmakers at this stage were becoming disillusioned with the increasing commercialization of cinema. In one of the best quotations you will ever find, Dali wrote of contemporary cinema as, quote, that psychological, artistic, literary, sentimental, humanitarian, musical, intellectual, spiritual, colonial, departmental, Portuguese crap, end quote. Significantly, sound films were flourishing two years later. The final scene can also be interpreted in, in a much different way. Liebman, for example, interprets this as the punishment of the woman who has transgressed. On the subject of gender representation, and to give you another perspective on this film, I had a quick chat to Dr. Deb Waterhouse Watson, who's a feminist scholar of literature and media, and an associate lecturer currently at Monash University in media, communication and English literature. Here's what she had to say. I think the representation of women is a lot more complex than people have given the film credit for. I mean, people have been quite quick to dismiss it as misogynist and Bunyal as a, as a misogynist um, because of the repeated images of sexual violence, um, the slitting of the eye, the, the groping, um, the chasing, uh, chasing around the woman. So I see the woman is breaking out of her shackles, to, particularly towards the end of the film, when she pokes her tongue out at the man and slams the door. I mean, that's actually quite revolutionary. It's quite an extreme um, form of rejection of what he's trying to do, uh, particularly at that time, um, the early 20th century. And there's also the question of shifting identity for the woman. I mean, yes, she has relationships with all these with these different men and you can make the argument that she's defined in that way but her identity is not fixed in a similar way to the way that the men's identities are not fixed she's not you know this unified category of woman in any more than he's in a unified category of man um, and there's gender ambiguity uh, in the figure of the new woman so the androgene um, you can see that femininity and femaleness is not defined as a category either. If you look at the back of the commercial DVD cover for this film, Ursha Andalou is described as a tale of unfulfilled desire. What do you think about this? Is there that much to the film? Or is there so much more? Is any search for coherence in such a film meaningless, inevitably doomed to fail? Is that part of the point? This lecturer has perhaps had way more questions than any attempted answers, and that's part of my point. I think a really fitting way to sum up my discussion of Osho Andalou is to look at a quotation from Matthew summing up the Surrealist project. Surrealists delight in enticing their audience into accompanying them down a path along which, like a compass that unaccountably has gone awry, reason soon has ceased to be of use in any effort to check our bearings. Our surrealist guides now permit us to observe that we can emerge from the unfamiliar situation into which they have led us, more precisely, come to terms with it, only when, giving up relying on reason, we look to imagination for assistance. So I'll leave you to look to your imagination for assistance. Have fun. And good luck.